Hi, chemistry students. Um, so in chapter 12, we start talking about bonding. Now we've done quite a bit of talk about ionic bonding and ions. Um, and now we're gonna start talking about the other types of bonds that we encounter. One of those in the last video, I thought I did a really good job explaining the difference between an ionic bond and a covalent bond. We know from everything we've done in chemistry so far that ionic bonds form between metals and nonmetals, and metals form positive ions known as cations, as Patrick would say, and nonmetals form negative ions known as anions. Oop, that's a no. Um, and and their their bond is formed because they've transferred electron from the metal to the nonmetal, and now we have a positive and a negative charge. And we know that positives and negatives are attracted to each other. So that's kind of the basics of an ionic bond. Now covalent bonds. This example is say oxygen, where you have the sharing of these outer electrons. So if they share two electrons each, and this actually because they're sharing all four of these, this is actually a double bond, um, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so these, these electrons are shared, and this, this atom shares them pretty evenly, and this is a covalent bond, and this occurs between nonmetals. Now, next in our chapter, we start talking about polar covalent bonds, and this is where the atoms are shared but they're not shared very equally. So you have, um, say with hydrogen and fluorine, we know that fluorine has seven electrons in its outermost energy level. So it's gonna have, even in terms of ionization energy, it's really low, but that's because it's pulling all the electrons toward it. It's gonna have a really high pull for the electron. So what happens is, is what, um, in general, the electrons tend to hang out a whole lot more around fluorine than they do around hydrogen. They are much more attracted to fluorine than hydrogen. What happens then is we then end up with partial charges, not full on ions, but partially ions. So this molecule would have a partial positive charge and this partial charge, that's partial, and it's um, the lower case Greek letter delta, okay? So this hydrogen would be a partial positive charge and this fluorine would then be a partial negative. Um, and these uh, partial charges are then responsible for some interesting kind of uh, things that we see of these substances. Um, you know that HF in this case is an acid, um, but we're gonna talk about part, uh, polar covalent bonds that are extremely important in, in terms of water. Um, okay, so before we get into electronegativity, um, in the videos we've been talking about sharing of electrons, like it's this very orderly process and they just orbit around both. We know that's not true from our last chapter, but what happens is in say a regular covalent bond, these electrons, they have a probability of being, they show high probability for being around either of these atoms. You would find these electrons kind of all around these atoms in these, in their spinning. Um, there's no likelihood that it's, uh, there's no chance that it's more likely to be around either of these. They're, they're equally likely to be around both. Now this changes for a polar covalent bond. Um, we know that fluorine attracts the electrons much more than say hydrogen does. So what happens is, is while the electron can be around both, it is much more likely to be found around the fluorine atom. So when they do uh, kind of their, uh, when they try to figure out where the electron is and they do the experiments, it's much, 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 much more likely for the electrons to be around this fluorine atom, which gives it that partial negative charge and hydrogen that partial positive charge.
So electronegativity is the relative ability of an atom to attract shared electrons to itself. Um, and this is kind of a, uh, um, a number that chemists have figured out from how these atoms bond. And then once they are bonded, how the electrons act around them. And in general, we're shown a um, chart of electronegativities. You can see that fluorine is up here at the highest with chlorine, oxygen, and nitrogen all having fairly high electronegativities. These electronegativities get very low in this column 1A. That's because when you have these compounds that form, these elements in column one don't want, they, they have a very low ability to keep the shared electrons kind of orbiting around them. Whereas these, these have a very high ability to keep shared electrons around them. So they, these would be very, very likely to attract, to be in ionic compounds, to attract the electrons to them completely. And these would be very likely to just give up electrons. So what, so what we use these values for is we actually use these values to determine what type of bond we have. So if they're really similar in electronegativity values, say you're bonding carbon and oxygen, and they're, they're really close in electronegativity values, that's probably a covalent bond. But if they're really, really far apart, that's when you start to get a polar covalent bond or even an ionic bond, depending on how big that difference between them is. So the polarity of a bond depends on the difference between the electronegativity values of the atoms for forming the bond. So I have drawn in here three different types of bonds. You should recognize this as an ionic bond. By now seeing these partial positive and partial negatives, you know this is polar covalent. And finally, seeing as this has neither partial charges and it looks kind of like one cohesive unit, this is our covalent bond. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the ionized, uh, I'm sorry, at the electronegativity values for each and determine what our values are for say a covalent bond, a polar covalent bond and an ionic bond. So if we're bonding oxygen and oxygen, oxygen has an electronegativity value of 3.5. You're subtracting 3.5. This is zero, which essentially, I mean, obviously if our electronegativity is zero, that means it's not electronegative at all. So this is definitely a covalent bond. Now with hydrogen and fluorine, we have hydrogen has a value of 2.1 and fluorine has a value of 4.0. 4.0 subtract 2.1 is equal to 1.9. And that is, you know, I mean, I think that would be barely, I think that's pretty high for polar covalent bond, but it is still within those values. Now, if we look at sodium and chlorine, we end up with sodium is 0 0.9 and chlorine has 3.0 value. 3.0 subtracts 0 0.9, that ends up with 2.1 in their electronegativity. Now, it's not much higher than this, I would guess that this is a fairly, um, a pretty strongly polar molecule. And whereas we know that sodium chloride is completely ionic. So what we're going to do in the example problem that I ask you to answer as part of your homework, we're going to actually analyze the difference in values and determine if it's covalent, polar, covalent, or ionic. And then we will, in, we will um, put we will put the uh, compounds in order of lowest to highest um, polarity. Okay, so we're looking at exercise 12.1. This is the example they did for you in the book. We're going to do A and B together, and then you will be required to enter what you got for C and D into the video. So the example is to um, determine the electronegativity
uh, difference between the values and then using that difference to determine if the bond is covalent or polycovalent and then arrange the um, molecules in terms of increasing polarity. So um, when we have our hydrogen molecule, it has a, a, electro, a difference in electronegativity of zero, therefore it's a covalent bond. When we have sulfur and hydrogen, well, first you have to find the electronegativity value of sulfur. So here's the electronegativity value of sulfur, it's 2.5. Here's hydrogen, 2.5, subtract 2.1 is 0.4, and that does give you a polar covalent bond. And then you're comparing chlorine and hydrogen. So chlorine has an electronegativity value of 3.0, and hydrogen still has 2.1. So 3.0 subtract 2.1 is 0 0.9. We have hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen has an electronegativity value of 3.5. Subtract our 2.1 gives us 1.4 polar covalent. And finally, hydrogen and fluorine. Fluorine has the highest electronegativity value um, followed by oxygen. So fluorine is 4.0, subtract 2.1, that gives you 1.9. So this has been arranged in terms of e increasing polarity already. So if um, it's highest, we've got our highest polarity molecule down here and our least polar molecule up here, our hydrogen and hydrogen diatomic molecule. Now we're going to do the example A and B together, which is part of your assignment. So here's our first one, 12.1A, which is more polar? We have hydrogen and phosphorus, so hydrogen phosphate and hydrogen, um, or hydrogen, yes, yeah, phosphide and hydrogen carbonide, I guess is how you would say that. Um, Phosphorus, let's see, if we look here on our table, phosphorus has a value of 2.1. So we're taking uh, the electronegativity value of phosphorus, which is 2.1, and we're subtracting the electronegativity value of hydrogen, which if you remember from before, or we can look again, up here, 2.1. 2.1 subtract 2.1 is zero, so we have a, uh, covalent bond. And then we're going to compare hydrogen and carbon. So if we look here at our table, we find carbon. Its value is 2.5. Subtract 2.1. Gives us a value of 0 0.4, which is, is polar covalent. Now, Looking at these values, which one is larger? We obviously have a much larger value in our hydrogen and carbon molecule. So the larger, the, the bond that's going to be more polar is hydrogen and carbon. Now this doesn't mean that it's, it's just CH, like that's its formula, or HC. This could mean that this is looking at um, any bond between just carbon and hydrogen. Okay, but for now, we simply look at the two elements that form our bond and looking at the difference in their electronegativity values tells us that when hydrogen bonds with carbon, it's going to be more polar than when hydrogen bonds with phosphorus. So we're going to do the same thing. Um, except that we will be looking at oxygen and fluorine and oxygen and iodine. So first we're gonna find what our values are for oxygen and fluorine. So fluorine we know has 4.0, oxygen is close behind that with 3.5. So our fluorine, our value is 4.0, subtract 3.5 for oxygen. That gives us a value of 0 0.5. Now the next one we're gonna look at is iodine. What is the electronegativity value of iodine? It happens to be 
and oxygen is still up here at 3.5. So we're gonna start with oxygen. We know oxygen has a value of 3.5. We're gonna subtract iodine's electronegativity value. That gives us exactly 1.0. 1.0 is larger than 0 0.5. So at this point, we know that oxygen and iodine is more polar than oxygen and fluorine. Okay, at this point, you need to answer questions B and C. Put those into the um, video question um, and, and then we'll move on. So what happens with these um, kind of polar covalent bonds is you have this occurrence called a dipole moment. And that's the charge distribution of a molecule can be represented by a positive center and a negative center. So in your hydrogen fluorine um, polar covalent bond, we know that hydrogen has a partial positive charge and fluorine has a partial negative charge. This allows us to draw in a dipole moment where we know that the, the center of our positive charge is here by our hydrogen and the center of our negative charge is here by in the end by our fluorine, so by our fluorine atom. So this is a dipole moment, what I just drew. Um, and it becomes especially important when we talk about the, um, the water molecule. So water molecules also form these dipole moments. You have your center of positive charge in between our two hydrogen atoms and the center of our negative charge by the oxygen. Okay, so this is a drawing of our water molecule with its dipole, dipole moment. So when water bonds with two hydrogens, each of these hydrogens has a partial positive charge. I'm sorry, when oxygen bonds with two hydrogens, then the oxygen ends up with a double partial negative charge. So when you draw in its dipole moment, the center of its positive charge is here between our hydrogens and the center of its negative charge is over here by the oxygen. So um, the fact that water is a polar molecule really explains a lot about um, its ability to do certain things. Well, first of all, water is attracted to itself. So when you have water all together, the hydrogens end up aligning with oxygens. And in general, water is attracted to itself. That's why when it, it forms droplets on the end of say your faucet, that's why when we measure water in a measuring cup, we measure to the bottom of that meniscus because it's polar, it's actually attracted to the glass. Um, so it forms droplets, it kind of stays together in form because of this this partial negative charge. Um, when it drops onto a pan, it forms kind of a rounded droplet. Okay, all that has to do with its polarity and the fact that it's actually attracted to its own molecules. The other thing that becomes important for water is we know that ionic compounds dissolve in water. So if this, this is an example of say table salt, sodium chloride dissolving in water. When you have the chlorine ions that are separated from your sodium ions, what happens is these chlorine ions attract the partial positives of your hydrogen um, atom within your molecule. And so you end up with this negative chlorine surrounded by these partial positive hydrogens. The same is true with sodium, except it's got a positive charge. So your positive ion sodium is surrounded by the partial negative oxygen charges. This is why compounds dissolve in water. This is actually super important. The polarity of water um, is a defining characteristic that makes it 
what it is and that's why it's so important. And the shape of its molecule makes it so that when it freezes, it has a larger volume than when it's a liquid. Um, so all of this part of molecule, this the what makes water so special is actually the shape of its molecule and how hydrogen and oxygen share their electrons and how those electron where those electrons tend to be in this molecule. Um, so the polarity of water is super important for its chemistry. At this point, you need to answer the questions at the end of chapter uh, section twelve point one. Um, there are six questions. Um, you need to answer those and hand those in. That is part of your homework for the week. In case you lost it, you could pause the video and read them here. Um, send those in to me either via document or um, you can take a picture and send it to me or you can call me and we can figure something else out for whatever works for you.